This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Tuesday, September 19th, 2023 edition. I am Justin Klein, and I am excited for this hour with you to give you some actionable material, some good data that will help enforce, reinforce your, your line of thinking, your thought process when it comes to making smart decisions with your money about what's happening in the economy, different sectors, et cetera. We're going to cover this all on today's show. And of course, I'm going to bring it all with an unbiased perspective developed with more than 20 plus years of investment experience. So we're going to talk about the market performance. We're going to run down some show topics. But as always, we're going to pivot to our first listener question now. Just calling about General Electric Company, ticker symbol GE. Uh, What's a good entry point for this stock? And also, what sector is it considered? Is it? I don't think it would be growth, but is it value? And kind of what's the backdrop of that sector right now during the economic cycle? Thank you for all you do. Talk to you later. Well, let's back up a little bit. And growth or value is not a sector. That is what we call style factor. Style factor. And GE is in the industrial sector. Okay. Now... How you define it, it's, this one's kind of – I call this more in the middle. Now, Morningstar, the Morningstar style box is, was the original way to kind of segment different companies into value versus growth or they even have core, which is kind of a blend of both. And that's where I'd put GE really. It's kind of in that middle. They're, they're growing again after many years of – reorganization, selling off on non-core assets, shoring up their balance sheet, et cetera. Now, they still have a good amount of debt on their balance sheet, but their business is improving dramatically. They only made 14 cents in 2020 after making 520 in 2019, so the pandemic hurt them a lot. And a lot of it had to do with aviation. Remember, GE has a huge jet engine division. And the projections for the next year or two have them climbing back to almost where they were pre-pandemic. Earnings are supposed to be back at $4.29 next year, $2.33 this year from $1.95 last year. So, and the technicals have improved dramatically, dramatically. So, and, and the strength is consistent. I mean, they've, they, they broke out back in January, one of the best performers of the year. It started the year right around $65 per share. And now we're at $116 per share. And it's just been grinding higher. Barely touched the 50-day moving average uh, until mid-August. Entire year, it just hung right around the 20-day uh, and just powering higher. So clearly the market is sending a message. This is a, a powerful move. And you know maybe the turnaround at GE is, is finally complete. Now, I will say the momentum has started to slow. You're starting to see a bit of weakness technically, but it's very minor. It's more on the indicators, not really in the, the price. The price is just uh, consolidating sideways. And maybe that's just, it could just be working off an overbought condition. That happens as well. And so, you know, GE is an interesting name. We're taking a look at it. We haven't made a, a, a complete decision on this name yet, but anything, any pullback into the 90s, low 90s, that would be a good buying opportunity. And that's kind of what we are watching for. And at that point, it would be trading in a low 20s for looking multiple, and that would be reasonable. Good balance sheet, like I said, sold off a lot of non-core assets after years of of, of, of mismanagement and uh, G capital problems and all of that. So I like what you're looking at, uh, but in the low 90s is the place where I'd pick up GE. All right. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover in the next 45 minutes, and time permitting, we're going to touch on all of it. 
First, we're going to look at four dangerous assumptions that could hurt your retirement planning. And I really like this topic because it covers some assumptions many people make about what will happen in the future. And some are assumptions that are just conditioned over time. Others are misguided. But we're going to really look at those details further. Also, are higher interest rates helping companies? Are they helping companies? Well, in fact, it's helping some. So we're going to look at which ones those are and how that cuts kind of both ways when the Fed raises interest rates. And then oil output. Shale output declined for the third straight month. The third straight month. We're going to look at why that might be. And then lastly, the fund industry is getting another I would say overhaul, but overhaul in regulation from the SEC and cracking down on deceptive product labels. So just like when you go to the grocery store, what you see on the bottle, what you see on that label, you probably expect to get inside that bottle or inside that packaging. Oftentimes in the fund industry, that's not the case. It says one thing, and there might be a sprinkle of that, but a lot of investors misinterpret exactly what they're investing in and the SEC is trying to, trying to deal with that. So we're going to look at that story. Also, some voice bank questions ready to play on setting a limit order as well as Chesapeake Energy. I hope to fit all of this into today's 40, next 45 minutes. We also have some iTunes review questions as well. Now let's look at the market overall today. It was a modestly negative day as we go into the Fed meeting tomorrow. Very mixed. The S, the broad large caps were up about, were down, excuse me, a quarter percent. Small caps were down the worst, 0.39% on the day. So a modest down day and interest rates were up. And what's interesting here is the market's kind of jockeying for position on what the Fed will say. The 10 year close at the highest level, I believe it's in 13 years. If you zoom all the way out, yeah, we're going back to 2000 and where are we? There we go. Yeah, 2007. 2007, the last time it was here. So, six, sorry, 16 years. Pretty amazing. Obviously, the Fed's looking at that, but the move index, which is kind of the the, the volatility index of bonds hasn't really moved up too dramatically. So, so far, the treasury market is in order, but higher interest rates obviously will weigh broadly on certain sectors of the economy and market valuations. So uh, that was the market today. Not a whole lot to talk about, frankly. You did have some economic news that came out. I believe yeah, it was housing starts. That Surprise to the downside, building permits, surprise to the upside. So a mixed bag is there. I would probably weigh more on the housing starts because those are actually happening. Permits are just pulling permits and potentially planning for the future. Housing starts down 11%. That was a big, big drop. So that was the big economic news today. And we get the big daddy of the Fed meetings tomorrow. All right. Now we're going to go into a break. Let me remind you, check out the new Investop Classroom series. It's streaming now for free on our YouTube channel. And we have a new episode up, episode seven. What was the name of it? I know we have a new one. Just came out. What was it? I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, cryptocurrency. That's what it is. Talking about cryptocurrency. It's our newest one. So head over to YouTube and search Invest Talk Classroom. Now the phone lines are open waiting for you at 888 chart Justin Klein talks about the KPP Financial Premium Newsletter. I want to remind you that this is a time where you probably need some guidance and you're tuning in to try to get our view of the markets. And we only have an hour here. And, and sometimes the way I distill each day can be maybe not enough, maybe not enough time. And so our premium newsletter is a great tool for especially newer investors trying to learn some things. The KPP Financial Premium Newsletter comes to your mailbox every Saturday. Learn how to analyze the market, learn what the economic numbers mean, 
learn how to manage a portfolio, maybe get an idea of what are good companies to be at least looking at. Maybe you don't buy it today, but you should always have a watch list of companies that, hey, these are interesting. These have good businesses. And if they get the right price, maybe I should buy them. So our newsletter is a great tool for that. Subscribe anytime at investtalk.com. The stock market is constantly changing, and serious investors know that they need to modify their portfolio assets to fit the times. And now, with more than 50 million downloads, Justin Klein and Steve Peasley reaffirm their commitment to providing unbiased finance and investment guidance here on Investalk. 888-99-CHART. Now, our main focus point today looks at this story. Are there, there are four dangerous assumptions that could hurt your retirement plan. Now, when you're planning for retirement, whether it's a couple of years away, many decades away, or maybe you're in retirement, no matter what, it's always hoping for the best, but plan for the worst. It's kind of a good mantra to go by. The problem is that most people don't know exactly what plan for the worst means and they make some dangerous assumptions. So let's go with number one. Number one is that stock and bond returns will be along the historical average. From 1926 through August of this year, the S&P 500 generated annualized returns of more than 10%. And that's kind of that number most people utilize. Oh, I'm going to get 10% from equities. And most of the time, that is fairly accurate. But there are certain stretches in market history where that's not the case. For example, the last decade of the 2000s, 2000 to 2009, 10, the S&P lost money on an annualized basis. So you didn't get that 10% over that decade. Why is that? Well, stocks started out the decade very expensive in 2000. And today, you know, markets, I wouldn't say are as overvalued, but you know, they're, they're pretty rich. So to say you're going to get 10% for the next 30 years, probably less than 50, 50, 50 chance. Now, maybe it's still nice. Maybe it's seven, eight percent, but to say you're going to get 10%, that's probably not the case. And then when it comes to bonds, you actually don't want to look at the historical returns. Because we just ended a 40-year bond bull market where interest rates went from very high level to next to nothing. And now that's reversing. And so if you're buying bonds, your general expectations for return should be what is the yield on those bonds today? Not looking backwards. So they've gotten better, but are they going to outstrip Equities, probably not. And especially when you're looking at a risk adjust or an inflation adjusted basis, you know, it might not be that amazing. So basically, you need to ratchet down your return projections just to be safe. Once again, plan for the worst. So, option number two inflation will be 2%. And we just ended a Long period, two decades of globalization, the rise of China, demographics, where all of these things mean more supply. And that means lower prices, or at least benign inflation. But we know over the past couple of years, that can change dramatically. So if you went into retirement right when COVID hit, maybe, and you expected 2% inflation going forward, this recent period wreaked havoc with your retirement plan. So what should you do? Long-term inflation numbers are actually closer to 3%. And that's definitely the starting point. If you're assuming less than 3%, I think you're in for a world of hurt. 
three to four percent probably is the range that you should be assuming going forward. And maybe adding inflation hedges. Things like commodities, precious metals, real estate, I bonds, tips. All of these are, are good inflation hedges. And that's another way to make sure that inflation doesn't rear its ugly head and you're left behind. And that means avoiding too many long duration fixed rate assets, fixed income assets. You saw that all those people get hurt last year with interest rates rising so dramatically and long term bonds falling, falling down. So those are the first two. We're going to go to a quick break. After the break, I'm going to get to three and four. Now, please remember that you can call anytime and leave your question on the Invest Talk Voice Bank. Or if you're listening via the live stream on AM 1220 in the Silicon Valley area, you can call right now at 888 chart Now, before the break, we touched on two dangerous assumptions when retirement planning. One is expecting too high market returns, and the second is inflation remaining relatively low. Now, number three would be being able to work past age 65, and there's been a big shift in the number of 60-year-olds that expect to live or work past the age of 65. Now, in 1991, the Employee Benefits Research Institute Retirement Confidence Survey had only 11% of respondents saying that they plan to retire after the age of 65. Last year's survey, that was 41%. 41%. The issue here, though, is that 46% of actual workers leave the workforce earlier than planned. 46 And a lot of this has to do with health considerations, either of themselves or a spouse or a parent, for example. Could just happen random unemployment, right? The economy gets weaker and you're unable to find another job. Or the demands, physical demands on the job are, are too, too large. Those are all big reasons why people tend to retire earlier than they had planned. So the mistake here is just assuming you'll be able to do so. So at a minimum, what you want to do is say, okay, I might work past 65, but maybe I'm not doing what I'm doing today. Maybe I'm not earning as much as I am today. Maybe I'm going to work, go work at a store that sells, you know, in an industry that I like, you know, maybe you go work in a, a, a nursery, right? And you like plants and that's your post 65 job and you're doing that part-time and that's the assumption as opposed to, Hey, I'm going to continue to make this much past the age of 65. And I actually would say the, the main, the main assumption you should make is I'm only going to work to 65. If I can great, that'll make my retirement planning better. But overall I should only plan for 65. Now, number four would be Receiving an inheritance. 70% of millennials surveyed said they expect to receive some sort of large inheritance. Whereas only 40% of their parents plan to leave one. So there's miscommunication there. And what's happening is with longer lifespans, higher costs of health care, rising long-term care costs, means that parents often spend a lot of that in the latter years. Because if you have it in your, in your 80s, 90s, are you going to save that for your children as opposed to spending it to make your life more comfortable? For example, is it cheaper to go live in a nursing home? It's more economical. Or if you have the money, Maybe staying in your home, hiring help on a regular basis, it's more comfortable. It's what most people would rather do. And guess what? The costs are often double, sometimes triple. And so if they have it, they tend to use it. And that tends to be less money going towards the next of kin. And I've seen this with my own family. My grandfather, his mother 
And it, in the latter years, you might see somebody who looks to be, you know, in their waning, waning years, but often it takes longer uh, than most people expect. And so simply just don't rely on any inheritance. If you get it, once again, that's great. All right, let's go to Sid in North Carolina. Let's talk about Playboy. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for taking uh, the call. Yeah, I, I own this one. Uh, probably I'm at loss a little bit. But do you think at this price, looking at the company's fundamental and how they will set up in the future, is it worth adding or just holding or we should forget about right now? What's, what's your take on that? Thank you so much for the time. Well, Playboy obviously has an incredible brand, uh, but the management team that took this over post spac it started off great, and it seems like they just did too much. They had somewhere around a dozen different growth initiatives, and a lot of them worked, but a lot of them were a waste of money. Uh, they bought two lingerie companies. One was Honey Burdette. Uh, the other was a smaller one. I believe it was called the Andy, and they just sold off Andy, and they did it at a, at a big loss. And it wasn't as fruitful. And Honey Burdette, it's doing well, but you know maybe not as well as expected. And they have they had a ton of other growth endeavors as well. And so they just did too much. They bit off more than they could chew. And management just hasn't done a great job. Now the 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 brand is still there. The brand still has a lot of value. And I think the brand value itself is a lot higher than the current value. But they need to, so the management team. And maybe it's a different management team. That's what I think. I think it just needs another management team that actually can focus and do what needs to be done to streamline the business and maximize the brand. And they haven't done that. And so until then, you know, I, I wouldn't be buying more here. Um, but I think eventually they do turn it around. Is it this management team? Is it another management team? We shall see. All right. Now, the next and the best talk, it's time to be. Is it time to be optimistic on bank stocks? The outlook for the industry overall seems to be turning a corner, but is it just a flash in the pan or will we have another crisis in the future? That story tomorrow, but for now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm ready to take your questions live at 888 chart Your objective is to work hard, plan well, and achieve financial freedom, right? You're in luck because Justin Klein is here now, ready to take your finance and investment questions. Call 888-99-CHART. Let's go to Richard in Santa Clara. Let's talk about annuities. Yes. Hi, Justin. First of all, I want to tell you you have a great show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, my question, this is a broad brush question, and in uh, looking at a fixed income part of a portfolio, I uh, just wanted to ask you the, uh, com uh, to contrast, uh, if, you, if you can get an annuity, a fixed annuity, uh, over time, you know, it depends, depends on when you sign up, of course. A long run type question. If you got a an annuity at a fixed rate, uh, also get a comparable rate through a CD or a Treasury bill. Let's say the advantage of the CD fixed, uh, the CD or Treasury bill, it's FDIC insured. When mm -hmm. you get it through an annuity, it's not FDIC insured. But the annuity, if you know, is forever that interest mm -hmm. rate, while the CD and the Treasury bill, you know, have termination dates and fluctuate. I guess my question, in terms of security, the fact that uh, uh, an annuity through an, a life insurance company is not FDIC insured, uh, is that something to be concerned about in the long run? And, you know, using an example like uh, an insurance company, let's say like security benefit, you look at its uh, credit rate, you know, uh, credit agencies give it a you know, a strong, you know, one uh, agency gives it a, an excellent, another gives it a good. I guess my question is just in terms of if you're looking for security, uh, is the fact that it's not FDIC insured 
a concern? Well, is it a concern? Well, it depends, like you said, on the rating and not just your credit rating, but it was called AM best rating. And, you know, you want that to be that to be high. So but no matter what, there's some risk there because that firm needs to be not just managed well today, but you don't know maybe it, what about the future? Is it going to be managed well into the future when you're collecting that? So there's certainly some risk there, some credit risk. It may be very low, probably is very low if you're getting a highly rated one that's been around a long time. But it's never going to be as good as the FDIC insurance because that's guaranteed. It's the government. They can, they will, can always make you whole. So that is one, I would say, small consideration. But the larger consideration to me in this environment is that a fixed annuity, that's a long duration asset, right? It's a fixed annuity. We just talked about this, that you are, that's the rate you're going to get no matter what, unless obviously, you know, the downside of, of, of some sort of default. But if interest rates continue to go up, if inflation continues to stay elevated, you're, you could be getting negative returns in many years. For example, last year, if you had a fixed annuity, you're getting 5 6%. Inflation was 9 You know, are you getting a COLA adjustment? You know, that that's that's maybe a rider I would think about, I would definitely think about on a fixed annuity is having those payments adjust over time. If that's, that's available, I would consider that in a big, big way. Because that changes your duration risk there. So that's that would be my biggest worry. Not the safety of it, because you know, that's something to think about, but it's it's a minor consideration for for most of these annuities that are out there. Most of them are highly rated and, and qual- from quality companies. But it's more of what type of duration risk are you taking? You know, a CD, a treasury, you know, you can you can make those relatively short term not take a lot of duration risk. And that's really the name of the game here. Now, now short term, medium term, you know, maybe taking a little duration makes sense, but over the long term as we enter this inflationary environment, it's not a good idea to tie yourself to too many long duration assets like a fixed annuity. Okay? Thanks for the call, Richard. Now let's touch a bit on oil output. This is an interesting story, and this is coming out of the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the EIA, and they come out with monthly drilling productivity reports, and they did so on Monday, and they're looking at the industry and what's being produced now and projecting out for the month of October, the next month, and they're saying that there's expected to be the third straight month of declining oil production here in the U.S., the lowest level since May. Now, that's really the story here. We're coming off a record amount of oil production in July. So, still producing a lot of oil. But that trend is peaking a little bit. And what's most interesting is where the production is dropping. And that is in the Permian Basin, which is the largest shale oil basin in the U.S. Even South Texas, Eagle Ford Shale, that's falling as well. Where it's growing is in the Bakken. That hasn't really been a big growth driver. So what you can see here is that the areas where maybe companies tap the best wells maybe they've tapped the majority of them. It's kind of what we've been saying for a while. They're, they're, produce, they're tapping the wells that are cheap and easy to get to and to produce from, for the most part. And shale, it's not like a traditional oil well. You don't just put in a straw and suck it out, right? There's a lot that goes into the production there. And companies are focused on returning money to shareholders, paying down debt, more than boosting their production. And that shows in the rig count. Rig count is down 122 or 16% from this time last year. And this is another reason why oil prices are starting to go up again. 
Oil prices up 14% this year after seven uh, going up 7% last year. And what's also interesting is that gas output is declining as well after hitting a records amount earlier this year. So gas prices are going up, not not gasoline, natural gas is what I'm talking about. So something to look out for. And a remember, the shale region, the shale production has been really the growth driver of production worldwide for the past decade plus. And so if that's not producing more, where is the additional oil going to come from to meet increasing demand? All right, let's... Touch on Invest Talk podcast review question. They Don from Ashland, Oregon, left a review on iTunes and says, I am 73, retired with a pension and Social Security that covers all my living expenses. I have a small position in JEPQ, JEPQ, and its sister fund, JEPI. They pay a monthly dividend that I use for recreational purposes. I'm thinking of expanding my position and wanted to get your take on these funds. All right, now these are basically covered call ETFs. And I believe JEPI is one of the largest that's out there. I'm trying to look at the total uh, amount. So JEPQ has, where is it? Total assets, $5.4 billion. JEPI has nearly 30 billion. So these are fairly popular funds because they pay consistent yield, but that yield is kind of all over the place. And if you look at the return so far this year, JEPI is up 7.3%. Now this is more active, doesn't really follow a particular index. Even those top holdings are Amazon, MasterCard, Microsoft, Adobe, Intuit, Progressive, AbbVie, Eli Lilly, Comcast, and Visa. So a lot of large cap names here. 117 names in its portfolio. Up, like I said, 7.3% this year. JEPQ, that's a more recent issue. I believe it came out last year. And it's up nicely, 27% this year. Now it's less than the NASDAQ as a whole. Uh, that's going to be a lot more volatile just because of the mix of assets. It's the, it's the NASDAQ. And I always say with the cover call assets or cover, cover, cover call funds, it's about the underlying asset more than anything. That's going to drive the returns. Now, selling cover calls certainly lower your risk and your volatility, help you bring in more income. But once again, these are just income. What's the total return you're getting, you're getting here? And so i rather have something that's a little bit more balanced. Now, this is still leaning on the growth side of the market. It's not a pure growth type fund like a, like JEPQ. So I'm picking one or the other. I'd be JEPI, but you know we run a cover call strategy, and we're definitely better than doing than J doing better than JEPI for the year and last year. So these are fine cover call funds if you don't want to do it yourself. You don't want to do any work. But if I'm picking one over the other, it's JEPI. Let's keep things moving. I'm swing back to the Best Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier on 888.99 chart. I was wondering, when you find a company you're interested in, in buying into, what methods do you use to determine a good price to set your limit order? Thanks for everything you do, and I'll be listening to your response on the podcast. Bye. Well, we usually have software that will flag us on a particular name, say we want to buy it at a certain a multiple it might be trading at, we want to buy it at a certain price level it might trade at, etc. So it'll alert us. And then we'll go out there and buy it. We'll set limit orders and, and, and try to buy it throughout the day for clients and what we call our block account and averages the price and then it allocates to everybody in that particular strategy. That's how we do it. Okay. Now, if you want to do it using limit orders, it's a lot easier for an individual. And you can go and set what's called a good till cancel order. Now, they're kind of misleading because they are canceled. It depends on the broker. I think it's usually after six months. It depends on the broker. Like I said, you want to check with your broker. But that's one way of doing it and, and uh, identifying an area that you want to pick it up. So what I would do is try to find a moving average you think that would be good support. For example, the 200-day moving average is a common one. Maybe it's the 100-day. Uh, you could also use an area where it previously broke out from. That's very common in technical analysis. Uh, 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 the price of an asset 
kind of trends sideways for a little while and eventually breaks out. Oftentimes, it will retest those breakout levels and then continue higher, and that's often very good support. So, for example, on the S&P, I'll just pull up the S&P as, uh, as an example because it did trend sideways basically in the f- uh, December of last year through, let's call it May. We hung around the 41, 40, call it 4,200 level on the, on the S&P. And once you went above 4,200, that, that was a breakout. And we did break out, hit 4,600, and we're starting to pull back. And that would be a good support level, around 4,200. So what you could say is when the SPX or the, the uh, corresponding ETF, maybe the SPY, uh, gets down to around the 420 level, that's when you want to pick it up. You put in a, go, a good till cancel order, and then you just wait for it potentially hit. Now, now may not hit, might might not hit that number. There's no guarantee it will, but that would be a good support, and that would be the way I would think about it. If you were just wanting to buy, you you want to set li, good till cancel limit orders on particular names that you want to own at certain prices. I'd be looking for previous breakout areas on those pullback. All right, now let's play two in a row at eight at eight ninety nine chart. Hi, Stephen Justin. This is Mike from North Carolina. I was wanting to ask you about Sunoco, ticker symbol SUN. I was wondering what might be a good entry point and what you think about the company in general. So at any rate, thank you for everything that you do, and I will be listening on the podcast. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, this is Sunoco limited partnership, limited partnership. And that's very important to understand here because this does pay a 7.1% dividend yield, but it's a limited partnership, which means you're going to get going to get a K1. That 7.1% is going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. And you need to be aware of that, especially if you're trying to hold this in a tax deferred account like an IRA or 401k. So that is the first First gate to, to pass through is understand that concept and know what you're getting into here. Now, Sunoco, it is in the business of manufacturing and marketing racing fuel, and it's the official fuel of NASCAR. Okay. It also is uh, operates wholesale and retail fuel distribution, and it distributes motor fuel to convenience stores, dealers, commercial customers, etc., Across many states, it operates stores like A Plus, Stripes, Aloha, Island Mart, and Tiger Market Brands. So it's in the business of gasoline. About a $5 billion market cap, roughly. And it does have a lot of debt on its balance sheet. That would be my biggest worry here. It is a bit levered. But it's trading at reasonable valuations. The technicals are certainly fine. They're certainly fine. You had a nice little move up to the last few days. It was a little overbought near term, but it's a good business. I have no problem with this name, but know what you're getting into because once again, it is a limited partnership and there are major tax implications with that for some people. And, you know, owning these limited partnerships within a tax deferred account can be a big, big headache. So you want to try to avoid that if at all possible. All right, this is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein. We have one goal each and every weekday, and that is to help you, help you take that next step in your journey. And it's always a journey. You're always learning something new. I'm always lear- always learning something new. And hopefully we're a part of that on a consistent basis. And the end goal is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom, which is different than the person next to you. Now, our work continues after this final break. So get your questions in now at 888 chart Justin Klein and Steve Beasley are ready to take on your finance and investment questions. Call Investalk, 888-99-CHART. Hey, Steve and Justin, I've got a question about EQT Corporation. It's an energy company, and Europe needing gas from other countries. This kind of came on my radar, so just kind of curious what you see looking at it. I appreciate your insight. Thanks so much. Bye. All right, looking at EQT, and this is an independent natural gas production company here in the U.S. 
uh, it produces in the Marcellus Shale as well as the Utica Shale regions of the Appalachian Basin. That is in the eastern United States. That's what I talked about where there's actually a bit of growth in, in, in gas production. And we like this name uh, in, in the energy space or in the, the natural gas space. Earnings this year are expected to be $2.29 and then next year up 95% to $4.46 per share, trading at $40 per share, 1.5% dividend yield, $15 billion market cap, and a modest amount of debt on its balance sheet. So return equity around 33% and it is a solid name and we like it. EQT is the symbol. All right, lastly, let's touch on how higher interest rates are actually helping some of the largest companies that are out there. You know, a lot of people have these golden handcuffs. They borrowed at 3% for their mortgage and they're not giving that up. They're not moving. And a lot of those people are, instead of paying down their mortgage, they're putting the money into the bank, maybe buying CDs, money market accounts, treasuries, et cetera, and earning well more than 4%. And that's one of the reasons why the economy is held up pretty well, among others, which I can get into. But in regards to individual companies, this is happening as well. Now, a lot of businesses borrowed tons of money pre-pandemic and even post-pandemic when interest rates were very, very low and borrowed for decades Some of them, their bonds don't mature for well over 10 years, some over 20 years. And what they did is they put a lot of cash on their balance sheet while their interest costs have remained relatively low and fixed, right? These are fixed rate bonds. And so what they're doing is they're actually earning a lot of money on that cash, And it's allowing companies to raise dividends, invest more in their business, and hire more people, all supporting the economy. Take Microsoft, for example. It's the world's second most valuable company, and it has more cash and short-term investments than it does debt. So it's certainly not going to default, and it has fixed borrowing costs. It's paid the exact same amount of interest in its latest quarter as it did a year ago, $492 million. But on its cash, it's earning now 3.3%, up from 2.1% before. So instead of earning $552 million like it did in the same quarter last year, it earned $905 million in the last quarter. And more broadly, corporate net interest payments, that's interest payments on their debt minus the interest they're receiving on savings, it actually fell as interest rates rose. Think about that. Higher interest rates helped more corporations than it hurt. Now, if you're a weaker company, you're a junk rated company, you have short dated maturities and that's that they tend, they tend to roll their maturities uh, a lot shorter. They don't want to lock in too high of rates for too long. But they're facing more refinancing at much higher rates. But even for those weaker companies, defaults and bankruptcies are up, but they're certainly not catastrophic. And there's been a study. They looked at the S&P 1500 and the largest 10% of companies, their interest expense is actually below where it was pre-pandemic. The smallest half of companies, it's up to the highest level in more than a decade. Those in the middle, they're kind of average. So if you're in smaller the company you are, the worse credit rating you have, the more interest rates are hurting you. The larger you are, the more it's actually benefited you, especially if you have a good balance sheet. And that's another reason why good balance sheets, quality companies with good balance sheets right now are outperforming. And I think we'll continue to do so for some time. All right, I'm Justin Klein. That completes another Invest Talk program. 
Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening, and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. And check out our new Invest Talk Classroom series. Episode 7 is titled Cryptocurrency Deep Dive. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461.